The entrance of God's word gives light and it brings understanding to the simple. Even as you're about listening to this message by the man of God, we hope that the light of God's word will be shed abroad in your heart. You will know what to do and you will know how to live. And so if you're new to this channel, kindly hit on that subscribe button for us. And then like this message. Also go to the comment section and comment whatever you have learned. Share this message abroad because we won't always be a blessing to the world. Thank you. Again, Dr. Damina, this is Easter is here with us. Thank you. And Easter is um, an important epochal occurrence in the history of Christianity. In fact, without Easter, there is no Pentecost. Yep. And without Easter, there's no Christianity. Yep. Without Easter, there's no resurrection. Right. What, how should Christians look at the essence of Easter? That Christ came to die for my sins and what else? Well, the whole essence of Easter is predicated on the fact that man sinned and man didn't have the wherewithal to help himself from his sins. Mm -hmm. Man had everything. He had the knowledge to invent, innovate, create, but man didn't have the resources to cure the problem of sin. So God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ to die on behalf of man as a substitute. All right, so Jesus died on our behalf, was buried, and on the third day he rose triumphantly, defeating sin, death, and the grave. So every year, Christians all over the world and non-Christians alike stand still at the time of Easter to recognize that there was a time when the Savior of this world came into this world, died, rose again and the christian faith is predicated on those events which begins with the incarnation where god became a man the book of isaiah says his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father the prince of peace so jesus is mighty god jesus is everlasting father jesus is the prince of peace which means therefore that the birth of christ which we call a birth was actually an incarnation a miracle because mary said to the angel how can these things be seen? I know not a man. So there was no, no will of man involved because John 1, 12 from 13 says that Jesus was made not of the will of man, nor of flesh, nor of blood, but of God. So that's why the best way theologically to look at it is what we call the incarnation, a miracle, a fusion of deity into humanity for the purpose of giving legality to the work of redemption. Man sinned, man died, to save man from sin that's the whole concept of the easter so it begins with the incarnation the descent of god into humanity the death of jesus his burial and his resurrection and consequently his ascension to the right hand of majesty on high that's why that event sets the tone it sets the foundation for all of christian belief all of christian pra practice and guarantees eternity with god how did christianity Okay, the word Christianity. Peter the Apostle never called himself a Christian. Paul the Apostle never called himself a Christian. Jesus Christ didn't call himself a Christian. But Jacob, Isaac, they called themselves Jews. And that was the essence of their worship. Being a Jew denoted a culture where you worship the God of Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, and Isaac. Jacob. Yep. So they gave a designation to who they are. Yep. Where did Christianity come from? The word Christianity. Well, the word Christianity came from the teaching ministry of Brother Paul in Antioch. After teaching Christ to those disciples of his over a period of time, because the gospel of Christ is, is, is transformative. And as they began to focus on that message of Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection. A transformation began to happen in their lives. Where those who observed this transformation could identify the transformation to what they saw in Christ. So they decided to call them Christians, Christ-like. That's where Christianity came from. Out of Paul's teaching ministry of the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christianity is an English word, is it? It's a, it's a, it's a Greek word. Christianity. It comes from Greek. It's a Greek word? Yep. The word Christ is Greek? Yes, Christos is Greek. But Christianity appeared to have been amplified by Rome, the Roman Empire. They spoke Latin, didn't they? Yes, they did. So did they, as Latin speakers, the powerful political empire, 
adopt a Greek terminology? Yes, they did. You know, when the Bible was written, English was not in existence at all. Mm -hmm. Because English is just about 800 years or thereabout. So when Christianity, I mean, when the Bible was written, there was no English language. That's why it's a translation from the Greek and the Hebrew, and of course the Latin Vulgate, which includes, you know, the Aramaic, which is broken Greek, which Jesus spoke. So, yeah, it's a Greek word. It's a Greek word. The people who live in Rome, who are not Christians, they look at Christianity as a political empire situated in the Vatican in Rome. And it has been there for 2,000 years. And the Roman Empire sort of wrought the Christian philosophy and the religion. And as they say, imposed it on the rest of the world, sometimes through war. How do you relate to the statement that if a person lives in Rome, he's not a Christian, and you tell him, he said, this Christianity is nothing spiritual. It's a political empire sitting at the Vatican. He can point this to you. That this is the Vatican. This is the heart of Christianity. This is where Christianity is. This is the citadel of it. It's not any spiritual religion. It's a political authority of Rome. Well, again, remember also when Jesus was on earth, there were the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the, 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 you know, the teachers of the law. They were part of the religion called Christianity as a then and Jesus brought a teaching that differed from what they were teaching the religious leaders of their day the Somebody, Judaism leaders the leaders of Judaism yes Judaism mm -hmm. leaders mm -hmm. because they were actually the leaders of the synagogue yes yes and they constituted the authority of the day but they were not Christians they were Judaism people yes that's why I said the Christianity of their day I'm just using but they that call word. it Judaism loosely yeah it's, this, it's, it's still, called, still Judaism is still on yeah so that's what because they were. it's a religion that is based on the worship of the law of Moses mm -hmm. and the worship by using you know the teachings of Moses in the law you know as as as, as they were relating with God all right, but when Jesus showed up, Jesus brought the teachings that differed from their own teachings. That's why the Bible says, from whence has this man this wisdom that he spoke with such authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees, which means that even in Jesus' time, there was religion, Judaism and all of that, just like you have Rome today. Mm -hmm. All right, but it didn't interfere with the emphasis of the gospel of Christ. When we talk about Christianity today, the modern Christianity, we sometimes push the law aside and we often say we are not under the law is that correct we're not under the law we're not under the law yeah we're not okay under hold the law. it there the bible said this word of the law shall not depart from your mouth yep. you shall meditate on it day and night yep. then will you make your way prosperous yep. and have good success i believe it's in exodus somewhere no, it's in joshua chapter 1 verse yes. 8 this word of the law this book of the this law. book of the law what law is it is that okay so remember moses is dead joshua takes over from moses Moses has laid down laws that govern Israel on their way to the promised land. Remember, they came out of Egypt. Moses left them halfway. Mm -hmm. And when Moses was about to die, in Numbers 27, verse 16 and 17, Moses said, let the Lord God, the God of all flesh, set a man over a congregation that will lead Israel to the promised land. So God asked Mo Moses to, to recommend, and Moses recommended Joshua. So Moses is dead. Joshua takes over. But before Joshua takes over, Moses instructs Joshua, there's a book of the law that will not depart out of your mouth if you're going to succeed in leading them to the promised land. So that statement was not made to you. It was made to Joshua specifically in that context that he will need the book of the law, which is like you're going to pastor these people. You will need the law of God in your mouth to feed them and pastor them to the promised land. Oh, so that word is only for Joshua. It was for Joshua. Not for us. Well, there are lessons to learn because the book of Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, what things soever were said aforetime, they were written for our learning. So there are things to learn in it. What are the things to learn? Number one, that if you meditate the scriptures, you meditate the word of God, the word of God will make you prosper in your relationship with God and in how you live upon the face of the earth. And there's a corroboration to that. David now will say in Psalm 1 verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in the law of the Lord does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His leaf also shall not wither, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So the lesson there is that if you meditate God's word and spend time meditating and pondering, the word of God will infiltrate your, your subconscious infiltrate your mind and order your mind to think in line with God's thought and God's thoughts is God's wisdom so you begin to navigate your way through life using the wisdom of God but that's bringing us back to the controversial point you just said navigate your way through life 
using the wisdom of God. Yes. So I'm a businessman. Yes. Navigate my way through my business life. Yes. Using the word of God, I become prosperous. Yes. Another person can be prosperous. Yes. He doesn't use Jesus. Yes. He may use something else. Yes. Because the devil has power to make wealth, isn't it? That's what the Bible said. It said the Lord your God giveth you power to make wealth. Well, he added again, no in that context. The devil told Jesus that I can give all this to you. Well, again, that context has to be explained again. When he says, Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, that it is he that giveth thee power to make wealth. Mm -hmm. He was speaking to Israel on their way from Egypt to the promised land. Mm -hmm. That you shall remember when God brought you out of Egypt, he gave you clothes you didn't buy. He gave you shoes you never bought. You were hungry, you had money, but you couldn't buy food. He gave you manna. You shall remember that through your journey from Egypt to the promised land, God gave you power to make wealth, to prosper in the land. That's what Joshua I mean, was telling the children. It's not for us. It's not for us. It, it's a context. How do we make wealth then? We make wealth by industry. We make wealth by business. We don't, we don't need to obtain power from God to make wealth. God already gave every human being power. Your brain, you went to school, you studied. That's you what the power is about. That's what the power is about. Today. So when I pray, shall I pray for my business? Oh, sure. You pray for your business. Then because you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit gives you direction. He gives you, you know, wisdom. He gives you ideas, concepts. But with all of that, you still need skills developed in school. You need all of that to be able to navigate. What you are saying is that if you are not trained as a lawyer, yes, there's no amount of law the Holy Spirit can teach you there's and it no. will work. The Holy no. Spirit can teach law, but you have to first be a lawyer to be qualified as a lawyer. Is that what you're saying? Yes. You so that you set the foundation for the support of the Holy Spirit to come upon it. Well, even with that, the Holy Spirit is limited to your, to your brain power. He cannot make you do what your brain does. But he can give you more information. Well, the once you're already a doctor, the information can give the you more Holy information. Spirit will give you is not in the law profession. It will be in giving you direction on when to speak, when not to speak, where to go, where not to go, when to get involved, when not to get involved. But when he gives you all of that direction, your expertise in law will be required to make you excel in that pursuit. Can he remind you of Article 19 if you needed it in court and you had forgotten? Can the Holy Spirit tell you that? Check article. Can, some, can you feel a sense of something that says, check Article 19? Again, and then you open the article and say, yes! That's again, what that's part of the leading of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. He will lead you, he will guide you, he will remind you things you have forgotten, but there are things you already know. That's what I'm saying. You've yes. you read it before in school, but yes. you've forgotten. Yes. Or you have not noticed that it is relevant for the point you're making now. Yes. And then you can be reminded can that check article 19. Members. Yes, he can remind you things. Then you make money thereby. Yes, you make money. So Holy Spirit has helped you to make So money. again, remember in our last interview, we said, yes, the Holy Spirit will give you direction and leading and help you because you're a child of God. But that is not why you succeeded. You succeeded because you had the required skill, you had the required equipment with which to succeed. So if I'm a pastor and I'm a teaching my congregation and I come to the church and I say that, separate the architects sit here, the lawyers sit here, the doctors sit here, the rest of you go to the other auditorium, let me talk to this group of people. And I tell them that you are an architect, you're a lawyer, a doctor, you're sitting in this church. You start your work without prayer. If you're an architect and you have a project, do five days fasting before you start. Hear from the Spirit before you start. And those of you who hear from the Spirit, come and give a testimony. Is that a prosperity gospel? Well, that's not a prosperity gospel. It's not. That's but, like but giving, I'm urging that's them like to bringing, use the Bible to that, make money. Yes, that's like and come bringing, and testify. That's like, and you will need that prayer for every other area of your life. I agree. Exactly. So that's like bringing the fundamental principles of the Christian life to bear for those architects, you know, uh, lawyers, mm -hmm. to know that as a child of God, whether you are going to the court of law or not, every day you've got to pray and fellowship with God. You've got to speak to God. Basic principles of the Christian life. And then I add that when you pray and you succeed, give God a dangerous offering. <laughs> the moment you put that, you've messed up the entire discourse. Why? Why do you have to give God a dangerous offering? Because you acknowledge that it is the prayer and the five days work that gave you a sterling qualities, reminded you of all your architectural principles, and you're able to deliver it. So give God a dangerous offering. As long as the dangerous offering is coming as thanksgiving. Yes, it is. Oh, sure. Why not? But that's, that, that's the point. It's thanksgiving. But yes. it has to be a dangerous one. Well, not, some, not some $200. <laughs> heavy. Something well, heavy. But, but the truth of the matter is, Jesus said, whoever is forgiving much, love it more. If the person truly realizes that it is God that helped him, you know, to, 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 to succeed in life, he wouldn't need to be motivated to do that. He would do it naturally. 
Yeah, but sometimes you have to talk to them. Sometimes you have to teach them. Yeah. You have to show them their responsibilities. But ultimately, they have to make the decision of what they want to give. If and I the have, Bible says, if a man giveth according to what he has, it is acceptable. If I have three pastors, and I see one of the pastors is very adept at talking to these professionals and, and reminding them to come and give an offering, and then I give him a role in the pastoral ministry, this guy will be responsible for professionals. Every Wednesday, he's going to talk to them. Am I diverting the... Uh, salvation message am i well, diluting it well for a child of god who has the nature of god in him the nature of god is given for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son you already have that nature in you you don't need too much uh, mobilization too much no 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 you just need to come into your realities the gospel of christ will stir up those deposits of god in the believer and they will flow naturally as he begins to grow in the knowledge of christ interesting Yep. So, uh, the last time we spoke, a uh, few things came out, especially the prosperity gospel. We'll get to that in a minute. But I was just looking at the video this morning. That was comparing uh, a testimony or a message that you gave, compared it to two other pastors. Uh, with the with, with uh, benefit of your indulgence, I can mention their names. I'm referring to Bishop Oyedipo and uh, uh, Pastor Adeboye. The subject matter was about the salvation. And whether or not a Christian can lose his salvation after he has obtained salvation, your view was different from theirs. I come to that. When can it be said that I have obtained salvation? What happens? Is it the go to church, raise up your hand, those of you who are at the back? Or the, how do I know that? I, because when I was growing up in school, there were some people who said something interesting. They said that they didn't need to be born again because they were born into it. Hmm. He was born by a Pentecost pastor from age two. He's been in the church. Age six, he's in the church. It's age is in the church. Seventeen, he's singing in the church. The twenty, what? What is God says? Raise your hand. So any time that altar call, as we called it, yeah. the altar call came, he was beyond it. So he didn't stand up because he's already in. When does one have salvation? How do you know? Well, first of all, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 from verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. It says, Say not in your heart, who shall go up to heaven to bring Christ down, or who shall go to the grave to raise Christ from the dead. He says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in your heart and in your mouth. That's the word of faith which we preach. That if you shall believe in your heart the Lord Jesus and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So salvation is predicated on the message. When the gospel, and Brother Paul tells us what the gospel is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. From verse 1, he started by saying, The gospel which I receive, I've delivered unto you. Verse 3, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Then he said in verse 14, If Christ be not risen, he says, then our gospel is vain. In verse 17, he says, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then you are deceived, you are still in your sins. Which means salvation will be predicated upon the message and understanding of the message of his death, burial, and resurrection. If that message has not been clearly communicated, even if a man answered the altar call, that man is not saved. It has to be the fact that he died as a substitute on your behalf. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose again. Understanding that message, even without coming to the altar, just that understanding within microseconds, you get saved. Hmm. Let me give you an example. When I was in secondary school, there were a lot of the young boys who didn't want to associate with Christianity, and we called them unbelievers. And uh, there was a big distinction in my boarding school between believers and unbelievers. So as a junior, one of the seniors called me. He was laughing at me. He said, why do you both call us unbelievers? I want to know. And I said, because you don't believe in the resurrection of Christ. He said, just that. I said, oh, yeah. He said, oh, but I believe. So I was stunned. I was 13 years old. He was about 17. He said, I believe. That's all. That's why you call us unbelievers. That we don't believe. I believe. Then I was, he said, so am I a believer? Because I believe. Mm -mm. I said, well, I don't know. He started celebrating. I'm a believer. Now I've become a believer no. because I believe. No. Why do we call them unbelievers? They are called unbelievers because the message is preached. They didn't understand the message. They didn't receive the message. So nothing happened in their hearts. How do we know that? Well, because it's happening in the hearts. Well, you will know that because once a man is truly saved, something happens. 
something happens. First of all, he himself is, is persuaded about it. Secondly, he begins to bring fruits of salvation. There will be fruits to eat. It's not just mouth. There will be fruits. Because if it's just mouth, the Bible says, Satan believes that there is God and he trembles. So Satan believes, but he's not saved. So that somebody says, I believe that Jesus is, he died. It's not enough. It, you have to receive the entire message, the complete message, in your heart. And then believe it in your heart. Then the miracle happens right in the heart of a man. But how do we ascertain it? Shakespeare said there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. How, this is so mental, so internal, so intangible. The man to whom that miracle happened in his heart will know it. Yes, I will know and it. And that's what happened. I will know it. And but how would you know that but I'm saved? I will know that eventually because the fruit of salvation, which begins with the joy of salvation, the peace of God, all of that is what will lead into the transformation of your life. And you can see the fruit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, temperance. All of those are fruits associated with salvation. Once a man receives salvation, those fruits will gradually begin to find expression. And that's how we will get to know that this man is truly saved. If you have two households, a man and a wife, a man and a wife in two different households, one of them is Christian, goes to church, so we assume that he's saved. The other one is not, because on Sundays they don't go to church. They are sitting outside eating and waiting to watch football. But you find that the one who is supposed to be saved does not express the salvation manifestations, joy, peace, love. The other one does. If you're looking at a situation like that, and you can find many, what do we say? Who is saved and who is not saved? Well, again, remember salvation is a birth into Christ. You are born again. All right, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus said to Jesus, what, what, you know, he says, Rabbi, you are a teacher come from God, and no one can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again. So salvation is a birth. You are born anew. The word anathem genoa. Mm -hmm. You are born anew, a birth. It's not like an item on the shelf. It's a birth where God's life fuses into you and brings you from death to life and becomes one with you. So you are one spirit with God. It's a birth. And when that happens, the Bible says, likewise the spirit beareth witness with our spirit. There will be a witness of the spirit. There will be a conviction that leads to a transformation. It will be so obvious. It will be very difficult to fake it. If you fake it, it's just, it won't be too long. It will be obvious that you are just faking it. There's a power that will come into you. The Bible says in John 1, 12, as many as receive him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. So there's, there's ability, there's power that will be unlocked in your heart. There will be, it will be very obvious. You will know it. And those who know you will know that something has happened. Even if the fruits are not yet obvious, it's just a matter of time. All the fruits will show forth. Hmm. With this understanding, you said once a person has salvation, he cannot lose it. Yes. Oedipo says salvation can be lost. And so did Adebo USA. And I'm just looking at it with the physical mind and physical presence. You go to court. Uh, you are accused of an offense. The judge says you are acquitted and discharged. For the moment, you are. But if you were to commit a crime, that acquittal will not stand anymore. Is it different in, in God's law? Yeah, it's different. Because the death you are saved, you are saved forever. Yes, because, you're going to heaven. Yes, because the death of Christ is once and for all. In the book of Hebrews, he says, but this man, after he has suffered, you know, he, he, he obtained eternal salvation for us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. So what the believer receives is God's life, and it's a birth. Jesus will say to Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. He uses the word birth. So when you are born, you are born. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can a man be born again when he's old? Shall he go into his mother's womb the second time and be born? Jesus said, are you a teacher of the Jews and you're speaking like this? That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. Meaning, once you are born a human being, you can never go back to your mother's womb to come out an animal. Same thing, once you are born of God, a child of God, you cannot unborn yourself. You are born, you are born. Irrespective of how you conduct your life after the... Um, Irrespective. After the... 
Yeah. Irrespective, but I say that irrespective cautiously because once you're born of God, his nature takes hold of you. Yes, you may have mistakes here and there, but the difference is if you're not born again, those mistakes, you will enjoy them. If you're born again, you will know that you are in a territory you don't belong to. You will not have pleasure in sin. You will not. Even if you fall into sin, you'll be sad because, you know, this environment is not my natural environment. And you want to come out very quickly. But if you fall into sin, and you know that this is sin, and you did it, are you suggesting to us that because you are saved, your cleansing uh, power is faster, and therefore you are cleansed of every sin you commit? But that's what the Bible teaches. So once you are born again, you will go to heaven, irrespective of what happens well, afterwards. Once you're born again, because you go to heaven, not because you're a good person. You are heaven bound because you believe in what Christ has done. Nothing to do with what you, how you conducted your life. Well, how you conducted your life will be affected by what Christ has done as you grow in that knowledge. I don't understand that. Now, so the day you receive Jesus, mm -hmm. Jesus comes in. You and Jesus becomes one. Mm -hmm. But you have a mind that stored up memory of your past life. Now, there's a battle between your past life and this new nature that is in your spirit. So we start teaching you the word of God. Your mind, the files, the old files, begins to get deleted by the knowledge of God's word. And new files are stored into your memory. So your life starts changing. But there are some old files that have not yet gone. So you find out that you are doing some things you used to do before. Not because that is your new destination, but because of memory. So as you keep receiving God's word, the transformation is progressive. That's what the Bible in Corinthians says, but we all with open face, beholding the glory of God as in a mirror, are changed into that same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. So the teaching of God's word begins to renew your mind to align with your new reality. And as that reality begins to dawn on your consciousness, your steps, your lifestyle, your speech, your conduct begins to be affected by the new nature in you. You may make mistakes here and there. So if you, you slip, it will be cleansed. Them. If you slip, it will be cleansed. Because the, the Bible the says... The difference with the other guy who is not born again, that when he slips, he has no redemption. He has no cleansing. Ah, I get it. That's why the book of 1 John chapter 2 says, My little children, these things write I unto you. He's talking to believers. That you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, mm. Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. John will put it like this again in 1st John chapter 1 verse 7 he says when you sin the blood of Jesus his son cleanseth from all unrighteousness mm -hmm. the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians he says that Jesus may present to himself a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing which means you are Jesus's responsibility you know uh, Paul this is it the word salvation mm -hmm. is a Greek word soteria that soteria is a Greek word that comes from a culture now, that word soteria comes from another word, the sota. The sota is like an emperor who goes to battle, defeats his enemies, takes over the territory, lives in the territory to secure the territory. So Jesus is the sota of salvation, the sota of soteria. When Jesus comes in, he conquers your entire life. Then he lives inside you to secure that territory. He doesn't go anywhere. He lives in there. To secure that territory. That's why Jesus will say, all that the Father has given to me, none is lost. Except the son of perdition, which was Judas Iscariot. That's why Jesus will say in John 10, 28 and 29, I give unto you eternal life, and you shall never perish. Neither shall any man be able to pluck you out of my hand. My Father that gave you to me is able to keep you from falling. So once a man is born again, he is born into Christ. Christ secures him. It's like you have a house. Your house doesn't take care of itself. Your house doesn't paint itself. Your house doesn't sweep itself. It is the owner of the house that sweeps the house. It's the owner of the house that paints the house. It is the owner of the house that sustains the house. You are God's house. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it is God's responsibility to clean you of every sin and every stain. It is God's responsibility to keep you always clean and pure from sin. And that is the job of the sota in the in the saved he lives in you forever two more questions on this segment and then we move on to another segment the 
argument in the Garden of Eden. I'm asking this on the basis that we, you said, and other pastors also say, that a man sinned and a man came for redemption. This happened and that happened. The Adam and Jesus. They called Jesus a second Adam. In the Garden of Eden, in the account that we read, the sin was shifted. Adam, in his advocacy before God, said that it is the woman who gave the thing to me. If you read the narrative, the woman first encountered the deceiver. Why did God decide that the sin is the man's sin? So that if he's bringing redemption, he came through a man. Why didn't the redemption come through a woman? Well, remember, the book of Genesis has an after-event reportage. Because Moses wrote Genesis. Moses wasn't there when it happened. Which means two things were responsible. Number one, oral tradition. Number two, a vision. And the language of vision... Sometimes, oral tradition? Yes, oral tradition. Moses, Moses spoke to somebody? Yes, people, people who documented the events of Genesis. Oh, I sure. thought the inspiration of the Holy Spirit came upon Moses and he wrote everything. Well, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit comes on men not to give them the information, but to inspire them to write. And I in see. the writing, you collate materials. Look at the way uh, Brother Paul will put it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. He says, And that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The next verse. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Mm -hmm. Now, let me break the two words down. The f first word in verse 15 says, From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. The word Holy Scriptures is the word Herios Grammar in the Greek, in the Greek where it was originally written. Herios grammar means you have known the subject matter, you have known the, the content, you have known the letters of the scriptures. Then in verse 16, all scripture is the word pas graphe. Pas graphe means all the writings, the documentation is given by inspiration. So the inspiration of God is in the art of documenting. It's like I said, Mr. Paul, please help me get to government house. When you get to government house, every event you observe, document for me. And then you saw the driver of the president slap the driver of the, of the vice president. Now, I inspired you to document, but I did not inspire the driver of the president to slap the, the, the driver of the, deput, of the vice president. But I inspired you to document. So the inspiration is in the documentation, not in the activities. Because it wasn't the Spirit of God that inspired Eve to sin against God. But the Spirit of God inspired Moses to document the So why do we attribute the sin to Adam and not Eve? Well, again, like I said, it's an after-event reportage. Yes. So you will now come to the New Testament to truly understand what happened in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament is called mystery. The New Testament is called revelation. The word musterion in the Greek. Musterion means that which requires interpretation. The New Testament is called Revelation Apocalypse. It means to unveil. So the New Testament unveils the Old Testament. All right. So what does the New Testament say about the event in Eden? Paul will say in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. The word entered is the Greek word esekomai. It means a foreign object that did not exist was introduced into the world. So where was it introduced from? Jesus will give us answers to that. He says, know you not that it is not what goes into a man that defiles the man, but what comes out of a man. For from within the heart of man proceed evil thoughts. So the fall of Adam and Eve were thoughts in their mind that rejected God. But why Adam, not Eve? Well, both of them. So why did we say we bring in a second Adam, not a second Eve? Well, Adam was the head of the team. Okay. So he takes responsibility for everything that happens. So that's a lesson from there. That's a lesson. That the man, the husband. He takes responsibility for the running of the home. Were the Adam and Eve married? Adam and Eve? Were they married? They were married by, 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 the, by the fact that God brought the two of them together as the first man and woman to begin the human There was no ceremony. No, it ha doesn't have to be ceremony. Marriage doesn't have to have a ceremony because marriage is cultural, depending on what culture. If you belong to an African culture. So we culture, understand that marriage is cultural. It's cultural. But African marriage in the cultural context is polygamous. Well, that is why, again, in polygamy, as a child of God, the Bible does not tell you how to marry, where to marry. But the Bible teaches you how to live in marriage. How to function within the confines of marriage. 
And if the word of God is going to teach you how to function within the confines of marriage, the word of God does not submit to culture. Culture submits to the word of God. So that is where that, that, that change comes. Once you get born again and you receive Christ, you now want to function within the confines of God's word as much as possible as you live within a culture. Has God's word prescribed monogamy as the proper style of marriage? Well, remember the last time we spoke about the patterns. Mm -hmm. God gave Moses, Adam and Adam and Eve. And then look at the fathers. The fathers all through the scriptures. Abraham, you know, look at Isaac, look at David. And you find John Jacob. Look at Jacob. He got married twice. Yes, he got married twice. Again, but like I say, there are examples in scripture that you look at the wisdom of God and how it functioned. What was the outcome of those examples? And what was the downside of those examples? And as a wise person, you want to go with the pattern that produced peace and produced comfort and produced confidence. Abraham married only one. Yes. But there was no peace in his house. Well, there was no peace in his house because he walked by the he he produced a generation by the flesh which was contrary to the word of god because god gave abraham a promise i'm going to give you a child a miracle child and abraham was too impatient and abraham walked by the flesh and produced ishmael that was not god's choice god's choice was isaac was that a, a sin that was a sin but god blessed ishmael well god blessed ishmael because it was not ishmael's fault that he came did god punish abraham for that you can see the punishment till tomorrow. Which one? The Jews and the Palestinians. Is that it's correct information? Long, yes, it's been a long standing. Ishmael is, is the foundation of it's been the a Arab long, world. It's been a long standing battle from Genesis. How okay. do we know that? I, is, is there it's an there anthropological the or, is there or the archaeological is reason there? to say that Ishmael, after having been banished by Abraham, sent, the Bible describes in the geography, north wars, northeast, and then he settled there and became very prosperous. How do we say that that's the Arabs? Again, remember. Why is that not South African? Why is that not <laughs> again, Danish? Again, remember, the Bible has types and shadows that can be traced. In Galatians chapter 4, uh, Paul broke it down. That which was born after the flesh persecuted that which was born after the spirit, Correct. which is an allegory. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the flesh and of the spirit. Speaking of uh, Ishmael and mm -hmm. Isaac which is what we have today in Israel and Palestine. How do we know it's Palestine? Israel has many enemies. Oh, they do. Yes, so they do. They, uh, so but their, most of their Ishmael enemies, being their principal enemy could be anywhere. Yeah, most of their enemies are from outside, but Ishmael is from inside. So Paul said in Galatians that enemies from inside? Four, chapter 4. He said that which was born after the flesh persecuted that which was born after the spirit, mm -hmm. which is an allegory. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and then he talked about um, he talked about uh, the, the, you know, the plan of God, which was Abraham to wait for God to give him a child at the right time. But Abraham was not patient to wait. So he went after the flesh and produced Ishmael, which became a conflict between the two of them. And that conflict, the impact of it is still on. Because the flesh and the spirit is used very predominantly in scripture to teach works and the finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. The spirit is the finished work of Christ. Ishmael is a type of man trying to qualify for God's acceptance. Isaac is what Christ has done, qualifies a man who believes in Christ. So that's why it's an allegory in scripture that communicates a lot of spiritual realities. But there are physical lessons to learn from the event itself. Dr. Damina. Yes. Uh, Ghana is in an election year. Last year, Nigeria was in an election year. If there is a pastor, and there are quite a few of them, who says that, by the grace of God, I have predicted every election in Nigeria correctly. I predicted that um, Shagari was going to win. He won. I predicted that Obasanjo was going to win. He won. I predicted that there would be a coup d'etat in Nigeria to be led by a guy called Mohammed Sani Abacha. It happened. I predicted good luck, Jonathan. He won. I predicted Muhammad Buhari, he won. Even in Ghana, I predicted John Kufour, and he won by the grace of God. Should we ignore that? Well, you know, uh, Mr. Paul, Christianity is apostolic and historic. Mm -hmm. So we want, to, we want to understand that Christian practice is based on what was handed down to us by Jesus, the head of the church, and the apostles of the Lamb. What they never did, we're not supposed to do. What they did, we're supposed to do. 
Jesus lived under a government in his time, but he never got involved with any form of predictions. And that's our master. He never spoke about anything politics. He was not even involved. He was never found at the corridors of power. But he was in that society. Doesn't he care about politics? Doesn't he care about government? Well, that's instructive. Apostle Paul, Peter, James, John, the foundational apostles lived in a time when they were under governments that were not even doing well. And they never said anything about it. The only time Paul had an opportunity to come to the corridors of power, he preached. And the, the king said, too much learning makes thou mad. You are beside yourself. You almost persuaded me to be a Christian. That's the much you will find. A Christian, a man of God that is truly a preacher of Christ, will follow the examples of those who have laid the foundation of the church. And not double into all of that. I have no problem with somebody predicting, just like a soothsayer can pre predict, a divine can God tell me the, the predict, Bible says God knows the beginning from the end, Alpha and Omega? Can He tell me who would win the elections in Nigeria next time if I pray to God that eternal God, please show me the way, show me the future? You said that you are the Alpha and the Omega, you said that the Holy Spirit has come to reveal all truths. Show me who is going to win this election. Is that a, a wrong prayer? No, it's it, He could show you. I mean, He could show you. Does He know? Day. Oh, he does. He knows the end from the beginning, beginning from the end. So he knows? He does. So he can tell you? He does. He can tell you. But like I've said, you must also realize that there's an apostolic foundation on which the church of Jesus operates, on which the church of Jesus functions. And we must not improve and innovate on that foundation. The Bible tells us in Corinthians, no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Paul will say the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets of the Lamb, Jesus himself being the cornerstone, which means Christianity is apostolic and historic. We stay within the confines of the traditions, and what I mean by traditions is the beliefs of scripture that we see practiced. So are you committing sin as a pastor? Are you out of line if you set out to conduct a two weeks fasting for God to tell you who is going to win Ghana's election? And that is why a lot of Nigerian prophets were messed up. By what? Predicting all kinds of stuff during the election that didn't happen a lot of them didn't happen didn't happen didn't even for, those, for those that it happened For those who predicted the Nigerian election so now that becomes, was going to win and he won so now it becomes a gamble How is it a gamble somebody because says I pray to both God. of them prayed and fasted this one comes to say this this one This one comes to say is that one is one of them false prophet? Well the one whose prediction didn't happen the fact well the fact that somebody predicted the Bible says, if somebody says, thus says the Lord, and it doesn't come to pass, don't believe him. Don't take him serious. Forever. Don't fear him. Because he's a false prophet. No, he didn't say because he's a false prophet. What did he say? <laughs> he just left it like that. <laughs> so if you predict that... Um, I will not. That uh, if, if, if a pastor predicts okay. that uh, Peter Obi was going to win the election, Many of them did. They did. I, I heard it. I've seen videos. That Peter Obi was going to win the election. That God is bringing salvation to Nigeria. Uh, Peter Obi is going to win the election. But remember Jesus said, my government is not of this world. If my government were be of, to be of this world, I would bring angels down. Would, his, g politics. But is, he said God is, is interested in the affairs of men. What does the that mean? The affairs of men simply mean God has put a planet put everything in the planet for men to operate the planet. But he says he's interested. His interest there is because he loves you. And because he loves you, he makes sure that everything in the planet works for you. Yes, he wants That's everything in interest. the planet to work for me. He's interested in the affairs of men. Here is Nigeria Super Eagles lined up against Ivory Coast Elephants for the grand final of the African Cup of Nations. Yes. I'm Nigerian. Yes. I'm God person. Yes. God loves me. Yes. I go to the temple yes. I say, eternal father. Yes. This one, don't let them laugh at me. Yes. Give Nigeria victory. Yes. And then I hear in my spirit, 2 1. Yes. Then I call the radio station Akwaibo. Yes. Listen, yes. the Lord has spoken to me. Yes. Nigeria will win by two goals to one. They say, Who scored the goals? I don't know who scored the goals, yes. but we're winning two goals to yes. one. 2 1 comes, Nigeria has won. Yes. I'm a great prophet. Well, that's what you say, but it's not just one. Pro to know a prophet in scripture doesn't come by predictions. Mm -mm. A prophet in the word of God is known by his ability to take the holy scriptures and bring Christ out. Prophet? Yes. I thought he's speaking the future. No. What do the prophets do? To prophesy. Old Testament prophets spoke into the future concerning Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection. In the book of Joel chapter 2, Joel took all that from the prophets and made it the collective responsibility of believers. 
I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh in the last days. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. It's no more the exclusive job of prophets to be seeing things. It now becomes our collective because the spirit of God now lives in the inside of so every the child. the office of, of prophet has expired. So in the New Testament, the office of the prophet is different from the office of the prophet in the Old Testament. How do you know that? Oh, that's what the Bible teaches. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, it says, He that ascended, descended, he gave gifts unto men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastoring teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints. Absolutely. To do the work of ministry so that the body of Christ can be edified. Not for the prediction of football games, not for the prediction of politics, but for the perfecting, equipping believers to do the work of ministry so that the body of Christ can be edified, so that we are no longer tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. And this was upon his resurrection. He laid down the blueprint of how the office of ministry ought to function in the body of Christ. And what the objectives, what the targets, what the responsibilities of this office of ministry is supposed to achieve. To raise a people for God that will preach the gospel, demonstrate the power of God, and be a blessing to humanity. That is the greatest agenda in the heart of God. Demonstrate the power of God. Yes. Is to show that as man limited by mortality yes i can tell you what will happen in december i'm demonstrating the power of no, god the demonstration of the power of god in this context is the salvation of men i'm not ashamed of the gospel of christ it is the power so the preaching of the gospel to save you is the power of god the gospel is that power and the mission of that power is salvation yes the, the salvation but i'm showing you that to save a man the god that i'm asking you to submit to his salvation it's a God who is all-encompassing. Yes. He can even tell you who can win a football match. But, but in the scriptures, you won't see that. I That's what it. I'm saying. But why is that prophet you see not the, on the line of a New Testament prophet? Because, you see, if, the, if it was open-ended... Because they don't do that every day. Yes. If they do was, that when an event comes. If it was open-ended, then there would be a lot of malpractices. The word of God is the check and balance for the oppression of gifts... The operation of the spirit. If the spirit is leading you to do something that contradicts the word of God, it cannot be the spirit of God. If the prophet says, uh, I'll come to negative prophecy, but positive prophecy, he says that Nigerian Afrobeat musician Bernard Boy, 2027, is going to perform at Wembley Stadium. There will be some casualties, but that performance will make Bernard Boy the greatest Afrobeat of all time. At this time, Bernard Boy tells his friends that. I will never perform at Wembley. And then they tell the pastor that you are crazy. You are totally crazy. Bernard Boy said he will never perform at Wembley. 2027, Bernard Boy performs at Wembley. There are casualties. He walks out with a big paycheck. He's been compared to Jay-Z. That's the prophet. How does that advance God's purpose on the earth? It grows the faith of the believers. Whose believers? The believers. Remember. Who, who heard it? Who heard the prophets of Jesus say something in the future? It looked like it's unlikely. But it happened. Remember, 40 years of miracles, Israel did not believe God. 40 what does that years mean? What does that... of miracles. Does it mean, therefore, that if miracles happens today, it doesn't build up the faith of the believers? Miracles alone are not enough. No, not, not only that, but it is that particular miracle will add to the faith of believers. That particular miracle will add to the faith of believers if it was within the confine of evangelism. Well, he said it's in church. So, well, said it in church. How does it benefit the church? Born by boy is not part of that church. Yes, but he's telling you that the Lord that you are serving, and that event, the Lord that you are serving, and that event, he knows today from that tomorrow. event is not to the glory of God. Which one? That event, that performance, that concert is not to the glory of God because the lyrics of the songs in that con concert are not of glory to God. I come to the song, but the prophet who told the guy. Uh, with the food in Israel, that tomorrow by this time, again, remember Old Testament. And that you will die. Remember the Old Testament prophets are different from the New Testament prophets. The New Testament prophets are said by God in the church. Give me an example of a New Testament prophet. Agabus. Yes. The one who predicted that Paul was going to be killed. Yes. That's Agabus. negative prophecy. Well, but Paul, Paul said, I am ready to die. And I'm ready to, you know, I'm ready to go to those people and die. And but so Agabus Paul is a knew. prophecy yes. of Paul, the death of but Paul. Remember Paul again, it is as it relates to the mission of evangelism. 
That's why I'm telling you that even the operation of the gifts of prophecy, which is from God, has to be with the, within the confines of the mission of God to save man from sin. But let's keep on Agabus. Agabus said, and I was going to go to pastors who predict somebody is going to die. This is now, going to happen. No, Agabus the said, point I'm making Paul is, it's not going like to die. believers cannot prophesy negative and um, um, prophesy death predict things mm -hmm. even in the negative even in the negative prophecy it is so that caution can be taken correction can be made and salvation can occur so negative prophecy is not in itself bad no because the essence is to re reveal so there can be redemption okay in ghana every year 31st december since the last five to four years Pastors turn up, and particular pastors are known for that, who give a prediction of the coming year. And they sometimes say that somebody is going to die. There's a law in Ghana in the books that says that a Ghanaian who is publish, publishing a document, like speech, should not publish something to occasion fear and panic. If you do that, you can be arrested by the police. The Inspector General of Police, over the last two years, will issue a statement on 31st December that any pastor who doesn't know and say somebody is going to die, we will catch him. Christians have been revolting against that command and authority from the police. That it is part of God's work. As you are saying, predicting somebody is going to die, it's not in itself bad. It is intended for caution, for prayer to come. And these pastors will usually say that if we don't pray, this guy will die. Is that a correct prophecy? Well, again, remember the Spirit of God does not peddle fear. Correct. Because God has not but given us spirit yeah, of Why are we to be afraid of it? It says if, it, if we don't pray, this person will die. Well, again, you know, even in the oppression of the gifts of the Spirit in the Bible, there is wisdom. There is wisdom in that oppression. Mm -hmm. You don't just speak things. There's wisdom. When God gives you a prophecy, he gives you the wisdom of communicating it. So God can give you a prophecy of someone who's going to die. And he will give you the wisdom on how to communicate it so it doesn't come with fear. The man that God sent the uh, angel to tell him that he was going to die so she put his house in order. Well, again, remember, it, it, it was Eli Isaiah who told Hezekiah. Mm -hmm. And Hezekiah said to God, God... But that's a, that's a prediction of death. Now, hold on. But Hezekiah said, God, you can't be in that prophecy. You can't be for my death. And God said, Isaiah, go back. I don't know what you did. Go no, back. Hezekiah went to plead. He didn't tell God that's, that. That's, he pleaded to God that please give that's, me more time. No, that's, that's in your own understanding. But in, what Bible, the scripture in Bible understanding, uh -huh. Isaiah said, uh, Ezekiah said, I'm going, to, I'm going to appeal to God. I'm going to remind God that the grave cannot praise him. The dead cannot praise him. So in my death, he has no praise. But in my life, he has praise. And God says, since he's to praise, 15 more years is added to you. Yeah, so God added but 15 again, remember, more years remember, because God had told Isaiah to tell Hezekiah to die. But, but remember, that was with the Old Testament lenses. God does not kill. He couldn't have sent Isaiah to tell Hezekiah to die and change his mind. God does not repent. God is not. So repent. Isaiah was not speaking. Isaiah just prophesied, as a prophet would just prophesy. But and God Ezekiah, could have told Hezekiah that I don't know anything about it's it. Not you know Isaiah. It's I don't not, know anything about it. But God said yes. I know about no, God it, didn't say but yes. I've added 50, the, the no. communication of adding 15 years. No, God didn't say yes. He's adding 15 years to what? No, God didn't say yes. What was he adding 15 years Well, again, years like I said, if you understand the character of God all through holistically, you know that God does not function like that. He doesn't kill? God doesn't kill. There's a scripture that says, I, the Lord, I do all things. I create that, no, I create that. No, there's no scripture like that. Oh, it's, it's here. There it is. Okay. Yeah, but, we'll find it for you. It says, yes. I, the Lord, I do all things. I yes. create darkness, I create light. Yes, that's Isaiah. That's in Isaiah. That's Isaiah. That's Isaiah speaking. That's Isaiah about speaking God. About God. It's not God Himself. Not talking. God Himself. So Isaiah was not telling us the truth. No, he wasn't. So we should ignore it. Yes. It's part of Scripture. Well, it's not everything that is part of Scripture that we take. It has to be interpreted in the light of. But Isaiah God. is a great prophet. He's a great prophet. Why do you say he wasn't okay, speaking? Let the me truth? show you something else. Isaiah said that Jesus did not, did not, did not subscribe to. Mm -hmm. In Isaiah chapter sixty-one, he says to proclaim the acceptable year of, of the, the Lord, Lord yeah. the day of vengeance of our God. Mm -hmm. When Jesus recited it, he omitted vengeance, and he closed the book. But the Bible says vengeance is of the Lord. Well, the vengeance there in that Isaiah context is different from the one you're quoting right now. Well, but 
if you look because at Isaiah, in, in the and then Bible, if you cross over from Isaiah to Revelation 13, 14, yes. this vengeance appears to manifest in what the eternal God will come and do in Jerusalem. So that's what I'm saying. Vengeance in that context is different from vengeance in this other context. In the Bible, there's no omnibus application to any word. Each word is interpreted within its context. The word may sound alike. For example, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. For God so loved the world. Love, love. Love not, he loves. So that the word world is used in different contexts. Different contexts. Yeah. It's For God so loved the world. Yes. But he says not love, so not the world. So world is not world, mm -hmm. even though world is world. So vengeance is so different. Vengeance, vengeance is not vengeance, even though vengeance is vengeance, depending on the context. So you have to look at the pretext. You process. make salvation look simple, takes you to heaven, cleanse. But the biblical interpretations that you provide, Dr. Damina, is very complicated. Which one? Like this. The, the uh, context. Isaiah was not telling the truth. Single mention is not doctrine. You, you make it difficult for Re us to Re believe that we can be normal Christians and uh, and uh, live our lives but you make us feel that to understand the bible is it's a long shot away because but, now when i read the bible i have to call you yeah. Dr. Damien, i just read as a, is it true or not yeah, that's, say it's true, that's, where, that's where teaching comes remember the bible is an ancient world that was written in a culture with a different worldview that was written in a different environment so to interpret the bible today you must sit where they sat hear what they had that's too long then travel to our but world that's too, today but that's what the holy spirit has come well the holy spirit has come yeah, through to bridge the gap through men yes through men through men to, to bridge the gap no to interpret but the holy spirit has come to all no it's it has, come to all men that is what available I'm to all men it's available but god gave you teachers he appointed teachers to teach he appointed pastors evangelists but you said the spirit of the, the lord scriptures. has fallen on all flesh falling on all flesh where it comes to the operation of gifts of the spirit or the gifts the gifts including the, the teaching prophecy teaching no, is not one of it no listen uh, teaching is part of it but before you teach you have to be taught you grow you learn then you're able to teach others paul will say to timothy the things you have heard of me among many witnesses the same commit to others so we teach you learn how to interpret scriptures jesus himself had to interpret scriptures and he taught the disciples for 40 days after 40 days they took jesus's pattern of interpretation and began to interpret in the book of acts into the epistles that is how god designed for his word to be interpreted nobody just takes the bible and interprets he has to be taught that's why the word he expounded the word daimonua which means he interpreted the scriptures which means Moses did not speak in literal terms. Which means the prophets did not speak in literal terms. So Jesus had to interpret them into the world in which he lives. The vocabulary that was in existence at, at the time he lived. So that what was said then can be of relevance to the understanding of the people of today. Because the Bible is an ancient book that requires interpretation. So that's why you don't pick words of scripture, hook, line, and sinker. You have to calm down and interpret. Look at the context. Look at the world in which that word was used. For example, I use this example all the time. If I said on my way to Accra, it rained cat and dogs, and I wrote in a book, 100 years from now, cat and dogs may not be in use as language of communication. Somebody picks the book to read. On my way to Accra, it rained cat and dogs. In his understanding then, cat and dogs were falling from the sky. It will take somebody who was in this world to tell him, no, it was a form of communication back then. Cat and dogs mean it rained heavily. That's what happens with the Bible. Because the Bible was written many, many years ago. The language of use, the worldview, the culture, the grammar, the vocabulary was of that time. Today, you have to take that worldview, translate it into today's, and apply what was communicated is that not understand. what what you are saying that we should be doing is that not what the committee did constantine's committee and it's in one of the notes that they gave me i'm going to find it um you said god doesn't kill but it's here in sodom and gomorrah he, he actually murdered everybody well again you know sodom and gomorrah was a type of the end of the world the day lot left it rained fire Jesus he so it was, is it a metaphor sodom and gomorrah is it metaphorical or well, is it real it, it was it, it was real it was real but, but why but do you say a type of end time a type and shadow 
You know, the Old Testament is types and shadows. Mm -hmm. Prophecies and promises. So it is indicating to us how it will be in the end time. Like it was socially. People are going to die in that manner. People are going to be. Yeah. If they Ananias reject, and Sapphira got the killed. Best. Ananias, yes, and, Ananias and Sapphira, Peter. Peter killed them. Yes. Yeah. God didn't kill them. God didn't Peter. kill them. Peter did. That's why later on, when Peter had grown spiritually, mm -hmm. the Simon, Simon the sorcerer committed mm -hmm. a worse offense than Ananias and Sapphira. He mm -hmm. didn't kill them. He just told them to repent of this evil in his heart. The scriptural issue that you're raising, which I think is confusing for those of us who are not full-time pastors or Bible No, you don't scholars, have to be full-time pastors the, to the, the Nicene Council, I don't know what I'm producing as well. Yes. They organized the books. Yes. But they must have captured it in the language of today. No, they captured it in the language of that day. That's where the original manuscript from where all translations come from mm -hmm. is the Greek. The yes, Hebrew. but the King James people where did the work in 16 something yes the king james people yes. in the english of that time, yes they not in they, the english of today english has not changed significantly well but it's changing i mean you not don't significantly. Use, you don't use verily verily you don't use the very really is understandable today okay so it's not it's not so, it's not complicated there's a lot you don't use that in today's english it's allowed no but it's allowed but in today's it. english the understanding will will be will almost not be not no very very really, really simple very very really means very but again remember the english of that day when the bible was translated from the greek and the hebrew to the english of that day mm -hmm. all right mm -hmm. the vocabulary the vocabulary available at that time was not as robust as it is right now i agree so that is why in today's english but, when but the you, context in, won't change significantly the context won't change it will change very significantly mary was for example let me, let me give you an example mm -hmm. study to show yourself approved unto god yes okay I've that word it. study is not study it's what in the greek is be diligent same well diligent study be similar di it's similar mm -hmm. but if you don't have that understanding you but diligent that. means what diligent to show yourself approved unto god yeah diligent that is what? give yourself diligent diligent in the context of that discourse mm. there's a discourse that was going on and then he brought in diligence yeah. in second timothy chapter 2 paul was addressing a minister of the gospel by the name of timothy and he was telling him to be diligent in the pursuit of his assignment and part of that diligence is in how he handles the scriptures that the scriptures must be rightly divided the word ototomio ototomio means when you take the scriptures you cut through the scriptures to arrive at the truth just like a medical doctor will carry out a caesarean section with expertise in making sure he does not cut the good parts and in making sure he does not leave part of the bad part he must be skilled just like the miners will go into the rocks and mine precious stones they must be skilled so they don't wound the precious stone and reduce its value and so they don't leave part of the precious stone their skill required so that kind of expertise that the doctor and the law and the, and the, the miner will use is the kind of expertise a man of god must use in handling the, the bible because you have to cut through to arrive at the truth should christians be concerned about certain books in the bible that have not been um, certain books in the bible that have not been uh, mentioned or read the 66 canonical books uh, for instance the book of um, enoch jasher etc sometimes when we're in school they used to talk about the six and seven books of moses should and we be concerned that our bible is not complete that no, it was the roman empire that decided that we should have this no bible? We, sh we shouldn't the early founding fathers of the church came up with the canonization of scripture and the reason was because there were many books written by the early father. the books were too many you can't even count them and so the early founding fathers decided what what should we have that is going to be our book or the book that reveals god to us so they came up with us uh, you know um it came up with requirements number one it must have divine origin number two it must have a consistent message number two it must be tied together by one revelation mm -hmm. so they began to take the books through canon do we leave some out all the other ones that didn't pass that test were left out so was that test a righteous test it was a righteous test. was it spiritual or was, it was administrative it was both spiritual administrative intellectual but, that's why this is the roman empire doing it yes what kind of spiritual no, the founding fathers of the christian faith of the, the, yes the apostolic fathers yes they did it yes who were they they put together the material that the nicene council looked into all of them and and saw the apostolic books 
and other books that are consistent together that has one common message and they found it was only 66 out of all the thousands of books and they canonize it and that's what we have as a bible and when you look at the bible it is tied together with one message one character. where's the six and seven books of moses well uh, i'm not bothered to look at it because i still have these 66 to to contend with and to understand could it be relevant though no. well or should we not should we where satisfy not where salvation is should concerned. we should we gratify ourselves with the fact that jesus christ said whatever it is the holy spirit will reveal to you no, so we don't need to worry about whether there's a book or there's no book the holy spirit will reveal to us no, there, all truths no there's a closure to the revelation and that closure is what the apostles of the lamb taught and where it ended that you said salvation uh, works in eternity. Yes. If a pastor who's obviously been saved has led people to salvation confesses that he's LGBT, would he go to hell? Again, like we said the last time we had an interview here, LGBT people are not bad people. They are just people suffering from identity crisis. Identity crisis. Identity crisis. They are not sure of who they are. Uh, okay. So how do you come into uh, knowing? Is it a who sin? You are? It's a sin to suffer from identity crisis yeah, it's a sin why sin against who well it's a sin against yourself and it will lead to sinning against god I don't oh yes the bible but identity us, crisis the bible can manifest in, itself the bible in different us, different ways the bible tells us in the book of romans chapter one mm -hmm. that men left the natural use of their bodies okay that's a sin mm -hmm. and god gave them up to do things that are not convenient that's yes, a sin. That is offending and the first, law of nature. And, and in First Timothy, mm -hmm. the Bible listed sins and homosexuality is part of it. But these sins are not, they are not sins that lead you to hell. Mm -hmm. But do they understand? lead you to? They are sins that, you know, keep you out of the will of God for your life. But you can go to heaven? That open the door for Satan to deal with you. Okay, but you can go to if heaven? If you believe in Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, you are in heaven. So you're a pastor, you believe in Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. You turn LGBT, your uh, uh, gay partner is one of your pastors. Both of you will go to heaven. But remember, a man of God cannot be a novice. So a man in identity crisis is not fit to pastor a church. A man of God must be matured must be given to the word of God and the word of I God get must that. So he can be mind. asked not to pastor the church. Will he go to heaven? Oh yeah, if, he's, if he believes in Jesus and is gay, he will go to heaven. Gays will go to heaven? Oh sure, why not? Gay? Yes. LGBT? Yes. Lesbians? If they transgender? Who did Jesus die for? Sinners. When did Jesus die? 2,000 while we years yet, ago. While we were yet? While we were yet sinners. So our in sins. That, while we were yet sinners, so, Christ died for So us. our sins did not stop his death. And the point you're making is that the LGBT sin is the same as me lying yes exactly the sin same as sin. where god is concerned yeah sin is sin so lying, if if my stealing. if if i lie and i cheat as a politician yes i occasion rigging elections lying the same i am the same category as LGBT. LGBT. all of you are together but we all make it to heaven no you make it to heaven only if you believe in jesus i mean that we are we are now, born again now but when you believe in jesus also a transformation begins to happen and i will probably stop the lgbt at yeah, some but, point yes you will but i may not you may and not die with it you may not you die with it cheated you go cheated to heaven you're marginalized yes you go to heaven but marginalized but the we kind we, of victory we have, been, we have been told so much about the disaster of hell that any part of heaven is good for anyone <laughs> so if you say this the boys at the back are going to say hooray pastor damina says we are good to go no they are not going to say if they really have the spirit of god you see the the, the, the beauty of this thing is anyone that is truly born of god mm -hmm. and he hears a message like this he doesn't see it as an opportunity to go and continue sinning he sees it as god's love for me is too much i cannot continue to make god unhappy bishop td jakes has denied allegations that he may be lgbt but he says even if it is true he has sinned against only god everyone should shut up is he right well, you know, when it comes to that, because I don't have all the facts, it's very difficult for me to comment. But this statement of, and it was made in the Bible, I think it was David also, that if I've sinned, I've sinned against only God. Everyone clear off. Well, you know, you know um, David said that after he killed Uriah in the Old Testament, in Psalm 51, mm -hmm. against thee and thee only have I sinned. But that is the truth. Actually, man's sin is basically against God. Because it is only God that forgives him. So David was right. David was right. T.D. Jakes is right. He's right. Hmm. Only God. Talk of David. Let me just digress a little bit and come, yes. to, come back to you with another 
uh, boyhood arguments we used to have. David was told by God that he cannot build a temple because this is his blood on his hands. Okay. In the scripture union you know, in those days, there was a big argument about why did God deny David the construction of the temple? Was it the immorality uh, of taking somebody's wife? Or was it the murder of Uriah? Or was it both? Well, again, you remember, the Bible clearly says it because there's blood in your hand. So it's the murder of Uriah? Both that. It's not the sexual immorality? No. The blood. Hmm. Many people will not like to hear you say that. Well, that's anyway, what the Bible says. I'd like to go to the video where we'll show you some of the things that uh, you have said. Okay. And then uh, we will get some explanations from you. But let me ask you, many Nigerians are not happy with you, Dr. Damina, because the example I already mentioned, in that, uh, on that Sunday afternoon at the um, Alassani Watara Stadium, you refused to say a prayer for the Super Eagles. Even when they took the lead, you didn't say any prayer for them, and they lost the game. You are in Nigeria. Well... How did they know I didn't pray? That's what they are telling me. That if you are so powerful that if you had prayed after the first goal, Nigeria would have won. If the Super Eagles had done their homework well, they would have won. <laughs> really? Yes. They didn't do their homework well? Yeah, they didn't do their homework well. Yeah. Because Philippe foot, George would not like football, to hear that. He's, football, he's a new coach of Nigeria. politics, is all competition amongst men. So give it your best shot. Do your training well. Do all you need to do well. Get in there and, and, and play your best. And if you win, good. If you don't win... Yeah. Is it a sin to steal elections? Well, again, it depends on what steel is. To, to change the figures and make somebody win. You know, I used to have somebody um, who was in um, the American government, a man of God. And he came to Nigeria and he said to me, Dr. Damina, you know, you guys in Nigeria, everybody says you're corrupt, you're corrupt, you're corrupt. Meanwhile, what some of you guys do in Nigeria that we call corrupt is exactly the same things we do in America. Absolutely. It's just that ours has constitutional backing. So why don't you guys back up yours with constitution so that it is no more corruption? The stealing of the election. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. Who's the best, a uh, final one for this segment before we go to the videos. Who, who, is, who is the best pastor in Nigeria? The best man of God. You have so many great men. You have Dr. Damina, you have... Uh, I, I don't know who is Depo, you I don't know who, Bayo, I don't know who is the... Boye, you have uh, uh, Chris Oyakilomi, who is one of my says, favorites. The Bible judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. Who shall bring to light the motives of men's hearts and thereafter shall every man have praise of god so we should wait it's for we now. should wait for jesus to descend it's to true. jerusalem and he will for, tell us for the coming of christ at the bema seat the great white throne i mean the the judgment seat of christ we will know there then who is the great man of it's only then far away, only then seven thousand years from now only then because what you call great today the motives could be wrong and there'll be no reward what you but call... the bible say by their fruits we shall know them no 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 their fruits you shall know them it's different in that context mm -hmm. from what we're talking about right now we're talking about who is the great man of god yes okay so the bible says judge nothing before the time until the lord comes okay let's talk about somebody who has passed benson idahosa he was a powerful prophet who could predict people could die he could kill witches Babangida was afraid of him. Was that correct? Well, he could predict big Again, time. Let, let's talk of somebody else who has died. Ryan Hardbonke mm -hmm. packed the best stadiums in Africa, mm -hmm. shook the whole world with his crusades. Before he passed, he said, you know what? I'm not going to attribute the success of my ministry to myself. Mm -hmm. You see, Ryan Hardbonke, but there are intercessors, people who prayed and fasted. There are people who did a lot of groundwork. I only just come to preach. And then he said, I'm sure when I see Jesus, some of these people have more reward than myself. Mm -hmm. So again, judge nothing before the time. Until that day when we see Jesus, and he brings all our works to the fire, and the fire tests everybody's works, then we shall now know who is the great man of God on that day. But before then, we keep laboring. We keep working faithfully and trusting God. If there's a believer who changes churches, in two years he has gone to six churches, is he the problem or the churches are the problem? He is in search of something he is yet to find. Mm -hmm. When he finds, he will settle down. Really? Yeah. L last one again. He's a believer. Yeah. When he finds it, he will settle Recently, down. there's been a phenomenon uh, on social media where pastors are leading prayer sessions on the phone in the night and in the morning. It's a very big one in Nigeria, which is followed by people in Ghana. Sometimes... 1.5 million people are tuned in to listen to a pastor they can't see 
and he's just leading them in prayer using scriptures the prayers that are most popular if you look at the way in which the social media goes up the prayers that are most popular are the one that you pray fire will burn you let the fire burn your enemies and then they all go ta 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 the fire burns your enemies in ghana we had a similar phenomenon it used to be called mopa it's still called mopa it's old it's a new one called alpha r some of the ministers of the gospel were concerned about this phenomenon yep. i spoke to one of them and he led me to a scripture uh, it was a scripture that i believe gamaliel was telling the uh, the council mm -hmm. about peter and co if it be of god yeah if it be of god it will remain is that the simple answer and I, I told the pastor this is just too simple he said he well, has nothing to say well if it's again, of god it will last again like i have said christianity mm -hmm. is apostolic mm -hmm. and historic mm -hmm. what the apostles never did we're not supposed to do i never saw any apostle in the scripture who did that pattern of ministry no but mobile. there was no mobile phone at that time Dr. well Lamina. again there was no mobile phone. yeah it's a communication but there could have been other forms of doing that communication the bible teaches was there an apostle who was on tv you were on tv dr david there was no but again like i said <laughs> it's apostolic and historic yes so we have to abide by apostolic practices god wants the believer to develop a relationship with him that is independent of anybody helping him god wants you to know him by yourself for yourself this yeah, but that's what they are doing they're leading people that's, to god that's what they're doing right yeah. okay. because the technology is new now yes. you're on tv but apostle peter was never on tv yes uh, so if you're saying we should do what the apostles did you shouldn't be on tv well again remember i'm on tv to teach god's word yes they are on the if radio the apostles, to help people if the pray. apostles if the apostles were alive they will be on tv to teach god's word if because the apostles were everywhere alive, they will they went, hold a mobile phone rally the night when teaching. people can go on and i'm teaching the word on mobile phones no they are leading them in prayer well again the bible tells us in the book of uh, of of ephesians we wrestle not against flesh and blood absolutely but against principalities and powers Correct. okay so a believer is supposed to develop a personal prayer life on his own mm -hmm. a personal prayer life but if I'm not able to develop a personal prayer life, why wouldn't and you? I know that every midnight, Alpha Hour will be on from midnight to two, and that becomes my foundation to build my prayer life. What's wrong with that? The point I'm making is beyond that, mm -hmm. a believer ought to have a personal prayer life that is built on serving Christ. Secondly, a believer's prayer is not supposed to be self-centered. It's supposed to be Christ and the kingdom-centered. Look at all the prayers. Suffered out a wish to live. Now look at all the prayers in the New Testament. There was no such prayer. But the suffered out a wish to live. That's a personal prayer. Well, that was, the, the in your that was in the Old Testament. There, I get confused again and when you say Old Testament. Scripture. So it's single it has no corroboration anywhere. Suffer not a wish to live. It has no corroboration anywhere. So is what? We should it's not ignore it. Yes. We should ignore it. Yes. And let the witches live. Who did Jesus die for? Enemies. Yes, in since. Christ that when you were enemies. But it says if you, if you prayed on your enemies, it's like you're heaping coals of fire on their head. Yeah, but so so pray and bless them. So that you heap coals of fire on their head. If the church had prayed for Paul to die when he was wasting the church, you will not have half of your New Testament today. Why would the church pray for Paul to die? Just like they're praying for people to die today. But Paul was with the church. That was, oh, you mean when he was persecuting the church? Yes. yes, but they prayed for him to die. They certainly that did. That was an act of witchcraft. No, there's no such record that they But Peter was to refusing die. to help Paul, even when the Lord told him, go and deal with that man. Peter yeah, was he refusing. was afraid. He didn't want to be killed. He was angry. No, no, he was afraid. He was angry that the, the great love if, of Jesus is being extended if, to this rogue. But if you read, you see what Ananias, when Ananias was asked to pray, he said, Lord, do you know the kind of havoc this guy is causing and you're sending him to that guy he kills people and jesus said go thy way he's a chosen vessel to bear my name and ananias went with that encouragement they were just afraid of him because he knew he was killing everywhere but he was blind he was blind just for that was not just at the time jesus told them to go that he was, was blind that was not permanent blindness i, I know but uh -huh. at the time jesus said go to paul he was blind and then ananias prayed for him and he received his sight yeah so i'm suggesting that, to you that they miracle. were not afraid anymore they were angry no that was a miracle they could yeah, have been angry miracle. in one sense but that anger didn't stop them from extending what god has instructed them to carry out to him i remember with enemies jesus said pray for your enemies bless those that curse you that you may be like your father which is in heaven which means your father in heaven's wish for everybody who hates you is for you to pray for them for you to desire for them to be saved the will of god is for all men to be saved witches non-witches wicked non-wicked that's god's purpose that's why jesus died and the church must be seen agreeing with god 
to believe God for the salvation of all men. If I come to work one evening and this is my chair, I come and they've poured black powder on it. And I take my phone and I call my pastor. So, so there's black powder. I said, put your right hand there, take a bit of water, let's start. Anybody who has done this, return to sender, return to sender. We're going to kill them. If they want to kill four of us, they will kill thousands of four by my right hand, ten thousand shall fall. Only with my eyes will I be holding. We're praying. Is that correct? Well, the believer ought to know his authority. Mm -hmm. and know that all those things you trample over them and mm -hmm. they shall not hurt you so when i see that should i call the pastor or not don't need why should you call the pastor what should i do i should sit on it when you are taught you just clean it <laughs> sit on it thing off and sit there but if i sit there and i start feeling in my back that kind of thing no, you won't my feel, head you, you won't feel because if you know your authority and you know that jesus destroyed principalities and powers and he made a public show of you and triumph over them if you know that you will not be afraid of any of such things satan is the least thing to worry about hmm. okay interesting let's get to the videos and then uh, and see what we got uh, it's time to take another break and uh, we'll come back shortly dr damina when we come back is going to uh, go on the uh, we'll show him some videos of what he has said and then he will respond to me. let's watch this video of you uh can you play the video now let's 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 watch it dr damina said it was not god that answered the prayer of elijah yes it was not the two fires in elijah story are not the same the fire of mount camel is from god because that fire was a miracle that is different from this one this one came to consume human beings that fire that consumed people was elijah opened the door to spirits now it is left for you to choose whether you believe jesus or elijah the problem is many nigerians who are christians do not have faith in jesus if i go to church where people are not taught to love all the emphasis is fall and die judgment be roasted be roasted be roasted touch me by mistake die by correction if i be a man of god dr damina said it was not god that answered the prayer of elijah yes it was not i repeat it was not the problem is many nigerians who are christians do not have faith in jesus they do not believe that jesus is god they see jesus as the same with elijah and moses so elijah if he says something jesus cannot correct it because they are age mates many nigerians do not understand that jesus is the lord and savior of elijah the absence of god's presence is destruction just like if you remove light what happens darkness if you remove life what happens death so god does not kill death is the absence of god god does not destroy destruction is the absence of god as long as god is there there can be no destruction nobody can destroy in the presence of god there is only one thing in the presence of god is fullness of joy <laughs> that's controversial elijah prayed as we are told and the children died you said elijah prayed to evil spirits second kings chapter one the Bible tells us, Elijah said, if I be a man of God, let fire come. And fire destroyed 250 people. Mm -hmm. In the book of Luke chapter 9, Jesus was to go through Samaria. Mm -hmm. And the Samarians refused him coming through their city. And his disciples said to Jesus, shall we command fire to come down and destroy these people as Elijah did? And Jesus turned down, rebuked them. Mm -hmm. And told them, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another city. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he refused them bringing the fire of Elijah down in the book of Luke, if he was standing by where Elijah spoke, he would have rebuked Elijah. Yeah, but Jesus is a mediator. He is the savior. He cannot do what Elijah did. It doesn't mean Elijah's uh, command did not come from God. No, he didn't. God never sends fire to destroy people. Yeah, but God punished Adam. The punishment of Adam mm -hmm. was spiritual separation. God punished Cain. Spiritual separation. What's that? Remember, spiritual separation means not extinction. They rejected the gospel. They said no to God. God can't force himself to them. So he gave them up to what they wanted. He gave them up to what they wanted. So who killed Adam the children for Elijah? Because Elijah didn't kill them himself. That's why Jesus said, you know not what manner of spirit 
you are off. That means there are spirits. Bible says neither give room to the devil. When with your pronouncements people believe in you and you open the door for Satan, he comes in to destroy them. Evil spirits can obey the word of Elijah? Oh sure, why not? That's why you don't give room to the devil. You give room to the devil with words. That's why the Bible says, say not in your heart. There are things you don't say. The righteousness of faith speaketh on this wise. So as a man of God, the members in your congregation are under your spiritual authority. You are the doorkeeper to that congregation. You can open the door for evil spirits to come in and carry out havoc. And if you do that, you are not fulfilling the ministry of Jesus Christ. Remember, did God punish Elijah for that? No, he didn't. We he didn't. rewarded him actually. Elijah didn't see death. Reward how? Elijah died. Oh, it's, it's Elisha that didn't see death. All of them died. Enoch didn't see death. Enoch died. But we are told that a chariot took him to heaven. In the Old Testament, uh -huh. it was a type of death. It was a type of death because Hebrews chapter 11. Elijah died. Yes. Hebrews chapter 11. What did he say? The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, Now faith is the substance of things so far, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain good report. Mm -hmm. Through faith we understand that the walls were framed by the word of God. Mm -hmm. That the things that do appear were made of things that do not appear. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Mm -hmm. That's verse 4. Mm -hmm. Then in verse 13 he now said, This all died. I don't understand. Enoch did not see death. Enoch died. This all of them died, not having received the promise, but they looked forward to the promise. So what was so, the type of death that Enoch died? Is it like the death that people die today? It was just a type of death. That, well, how does that, it manifest? People well, die Bible today says, by life, becoming a lifeless the body. The Bible says he was not. He was not. God took him. But yes. Hebrews tells us he died. Elijah, so when they say God took him, how should we understand it? Well, that's death. His spirit went to God. His body went to the earth. But it says by faith he did not see death. By faith he did not see death. That's what the Old Testament says. But Hebrews interpreting, remember the New Testament interprets the Old Testament. In the interpretation of it, Revelation tells us that this all died. That is why they were waiting for Jesus to rise from the dead. Nobody went to heaven till Jesus came and died and rose. John chapter 3 verse 13 he says, no man has ascended up to heaven, but the Son of Man which came down from heaven. So nobody went to heaven before Jesus rose from the dead. All of them died. And they were buried and kept in paradise in the underworld, awaiting the resurrection of Jesus, which opens man's access into heaven. Hmm. That's very complicated, I'm sure. No, it's very, it's very so this video we showed of you right now. Yes. Uh, you said people shouldn't pray for people to die. Yes. That's not love. The gospel is the love of God. God loved. But why doesn't God punish the people who do that? Like Elijah. Because there's a day of punishment coming. That day has not yet come. Today is the day but of But Elijah Sabbath. will go to heaven. Elijah will go to heaven because uh, Elijah in the Old Testament, in spite of all he did, still believed in the resurrection of Jesus. The, the aforetold resurrection of Jesus. They believed it in a promise like abraham that he will come he will die and he will resurrect that faith so that, in that that's promise salvation was them. salvation to them bible says they died in faith today people die in christ there are two different things they died in faith today people die in christ those who died in faith rose together with jesus on the resurrection day but those who died in christ are still in the grave awaiting the resurrection of the body when mortality shall put on immortality. Where is the soul of the person who is died and who is in Christ? The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if a believer dies today, he is present with the Lord where he has always been. It's just that this compartment is no more there. It's in the grave. So they are present with the Lord. They are present with the Lord. I believe a person who dies not in Christ, where is his soul? A person who dies not in Christ is in outer darkness. What's that? In outer darkness, hell. Not but they fire. said hell hasn't started yet. Not fire. Not fire hell. Not fire hell. But, but hell, a place of outer darkness where those without Christ are assembled awaiting judgment. And the place is dark. Physically dark or we don't know. Well, you just call it outer darkness. No light there. God is not there. God is light. The parable told in the Bible about a rich man who was looking for uh, Lazarus to uh, get his people and Lazarus to drip him water. Is it a parable that we should understand as a metaphor or as an actual story? No, it's a parable that we should understand that it has facts, it has fictions, but there's a lesson to learn. The lesson simply is that before Jesus rose from the dead, 
both the righteous people and the unrighteous were close by Mm -hmm. but not in the same place mm -hmm. that's why the rich man could call lazarus and lazarus and abraham could answer the rich man they were in the same area but upon the resurrection of jesus he evacuated the saints that were there and they all went up with him up yes they went they, they went somewhere else into glory yes they went into him with him into glory. so now if you are where lazarus uh, the rich man was you can't see abraham if you're where the rich man yes because there was a god fixed between them so now you can't see Abraham. No, you can't. Hmm. Yeah. Let's look at another video uh, now. Uh, please play the video. Question will be this: What was the tithe used for? Yes. Number one, it was used to support the house of God. Correct. Number two, it was used to support the Levites. Yes. Number three, it was used to support the, the strangers, the yes. orphans, yes, and the widows. Still the same. So in the New Testament, yes. why do we give? We give to support the work of God. Absolutely. Why do we give? We give to support the man of God. Yeah. Why do we give? We give to support the poor, the widows, and the orphans in the church. Correct. But in the New Testament, there's no legalism attached to it. Moreover, if people under the blood of bulls and goats were given 10%, how much more a man under the blood of Christ? To give more. So generosity. That's what the first fruit Much comes more from. giving. No, the first fruit is not. So you are not against Titan after all, Abel Damina? No, I'm not. I don't. You see, let people not. Just, but if you Google Abel Damina now, they say away. you're against Titan. Let them not run away with social media hypes and bloggers who are looking for, for views and followings. Oh, I when see. When people listen to me, they need to go to my YouTube channel and get the complete message. I see. If people can just patiently follow what I teach, most of the impressions people have about me, they will throw it away. Oh, I'm happy to hear that because any, any Google search of a builder man, I will tell you that here's a man who's against Titan. So I was surprised. Because bloggers who are looking for, for following and views. So are you, have a, you have a, a period in your church where they say it's Titan time. Bring your. No, we book. don't have Titan in our church. We ask people to give generously. So how many and offerings do you take during the service? We give, like, we give like two offerings. During the service? Yes. During Which is the same for many churches? Yeah, two offerings. One offering is the offering we give in honor of the word of God. To enable us to do more for the kingdom mm -hmm. and then the second offering are the offerings we give for bills to be paid tv broadcast radio and all of that have you amended your tight message no i've never i can never that's the truth so you take tight i don't take tight i thought in light of what i'm teaching there on the video so you take offering we take offerings generosity you don't call it tight no it's not about the calling it's about the legalism in it the tithe has a legalism attached to it that if you don't god will not rebuke the devourer if you don't satan will come after you if you don't that's the legalism in it that in the new testament we don't have that legalism generosity is what we have we give to god generously we give to god willingly we give to god in response to our understanding of his love for us and the work he has left for us to do on the earth if you don't give to the church, but you give to people on the street, give to orphanage like Bill Gates does, Elon Musk, the paid is that also a blessing? Well, that's that's secular. It it's not Bible. So that's not blessing. That's not Bible. I can't say it's not blessing, but it's not Bible. Ron can only made a song and said, "When you give, give to the Lord." Yes. Give to the Lord only. That means give to church or well, give, give to a pastor. Well, when you give to the church, remember the church has an organized system by which the money will be utilized, both for the work. To give to the welfare of the poor like it was in the book of acts the givings were to the church then the church set up a welfare system where things were properly distributed in chapter 6 the same thing people were appointed because there must be an organized leadership in how these monies are administered effectively to serve the purpose of god on earth i've had nigerian businessmen who say that 30 percent of my tithe goes to a depot 20 percent goes here 20 percent to personally to the man of god is it wrong well, again, it's their money. They have a right to do whatever they want. Will they to be do blessed? Well, you are not blessed because you gave. You are blessed because you are blessed. God blessed you before you gave. Whether you give or not, you'll be blessed. Whether you give or not, you're already blessed. It has nothing to do with your prosperity. It has nothing to do with it. But as a responsible child of God who is growing in the knowledge of Christ, you give, of course, to support God's work. Do we have ancestral curses? And some pastors teach on what they call altars and foundations. Do we have ancestral cases that require a lot more prayer to take it out of well, a man's life? Once a man comes into Christ, he doesn't have none of those. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Now, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. The man in Christ doesn't have a foundation. 
No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, Christ Jesus. So the believer in Christ is already on the right foundation. You don't have to break any foundation for him. The people that could have curses and have foundational problems are people without Christ. But for the believer in Christ, what Christ has done is more than enough. The only thing the believer will now need is knowledge. The knowledge of what has been done so he can walk in the reality of what Christ has done. The believer is in victory. The believer has defeated Satan. The believer has authority over Satan and his cohorts. And all the believer needs to know is to understand the authority. That has been. That's why Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That you may know number one, the hope of his calling. Number two, the riches of his inheritance. Then number three, that you may know the exceeding greatness of his power to us world who believe. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Remember Jesus said, behold, I give you power to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the devil. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. So the believer in Christ just needs to understand what Christ has done. The authority available to him and function in that reality. So you don't have to go for teachings of altars and foundations. No, you to don't. See, if, your, if your father was a fetish priest... Should you be worried that the cases are to the third and fourth generation? It's darkness and light. Mm -hmm. Darkness and light. Light is not, doesn't need to worry about darkness. The appearance of light is the disappearance of darkness. The believer is in light. The Bible says you have become, who have delivered us, delivered, passed from the kingdom of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. So the believer has moved from one kingdom to another. It's like I'm in Ghana now. I was in Nigeria yesterday before you flew me in here. When I was in Nigeria, I was under the jurisdiction of the Nigerian laws. But now I'm in Ghana. I'm under Ghana laws. I'm not going to violate Ghana laws because in Nigeria, that's not a law. So when you move from darkness to light, you came under a new government. In the light, in the kingdom of God, darkness cannot operate there. So a man cannot be born of God and be worrying about darkness and Satan. He's a master over satan over demons and over all the forces of darkness and whatever satan can can offer and if satan misbehaves the bible says you resist him he flees the believer is in victory and authority so teaching a believer to go and begin to examine foundations to go and begin to study ancestral causes is taking a man from light to darkness is messing up the man's identity is reducing the person to a place from where christ exalted him from is subtracting taking value away from that person. Instead of worrying about darkness, you just try to discover the light that you have become and walk in that light and subdue darkness because the light shines in darkness and the darkness cannot handle it. Jesus Christ told his apostles one day that the kinds of things they were encountering with the demon, it required fasting and prayer. That's Matthew chapter 21. What does it mean? What, what Jesus was simply saying is they couldn't heal somebody and they brought them to Jesus and Jesus said, it was because of your unbelief. Mm -hmm. Your unbelief. Mm -hmm. How be it, this kind of your unbelief, this kind of your unbelief cannot go out except by prayer. The first thing they cannot are, go out of them. The, the, the disciples. Uh, that the unbelief the way cannot to overcome go out their of the disciples except by fasting and by prayer. prayer. So the fasting and prayer referred to is not the healing of the sickness. No, no, no. It's the unbelief. It is about themselves. Yes. That they needed fasting and prayer to, to get the faith. To get, yeah, to get over the unbelief that hindered them from operating in faith. Fasting and prayer. Yes. I thought faith was simple. I thought well, you were born again. That was simple. before Jesus died. Okay. Again. Remember, Jesus was under the law. Mm -hmm. So he just operated with what was available as at that time. But upon his resurrection, the moment you receive Christ, all of faith comes on your inside. Jesus is the author and the finisher of faith. When Christ enters you, all of God's faith comes on your inside. When we think of Easter, should we cry or should we rejoice? We should rejoice. He's no more in the grave. He's alive. He has defeated sin. He has defeated hell. He has defeated the grave. He has defeated eternal damnation. And the moment you receive that work of his cross, you pass from death to life. It calls for rejoicing. And even if you cry, it should be tears of joy. So we shouldn't watch Mel Gibson's video the passion of the christ you go to the, the uh, cinema hall they are watching and everyone is crying well I mean, they are crying about the suffering of jesus well again and that film does not include the resurrection anyway yeah so it, it the message is lost mm. it's hollywood for money okay dr damina there's this scripture that is confusing a few people revelations 3 9 those who say they are jews and they are not but they are 
part of the synagogue of Satan. I will bring them to worship before you. Some have interpreted this scripture to mean that it is reference to present day Jews, most of whom are Americans and British, who trace their origin to Judaism in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, as you know, was created by American British in the Second World War. Yeah. And some pastors or some people want us to understand this scripture to mean the current crop of people who call themselves Jews are really not Jews at all. How do but, you see that scripture? Well, again, you know, the book of Revelation is a bit complex in the fact that it requires a lot of interpretation. And the reason is simply because it was a book written out of a vision mm -hmm. that was given to John. And once you're dealing with visions, you need to be a bit careful. But the core message of that book is chapter 2 and chapter 3, the later to the seven churches. Mm -hmm. The emphasis of that, that later to the seven churches was doctrine. Mm -hmm. Doctrine, what they were teaching that was not in line with the finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. What they were teaching that exalted works what they were teaching that brought, you know, in fact, one of the churches says because you excavate the depths of Satan. Churches that talk about the fingers of Satan, you know, uh, the mysteries of Satan, exposing Satan, and all the emphasis is Satan, Satan, Satan. And he wrote a letter to that church and warned them to stay away from such teachings because those teachings are contrary to the finished work of Christ. You know, when you deal with Jews in the Bible, the Bible way of dealing with Jewish people has to do with the, the, the Old Testament Jews where there was a dichotomy between the gentiles and the jews which in christ jesus now there is neither jew no gentile all has been amalgamated and out of them a new kind of humanity has been brought forth so again all those letters were rebukes because of doctrines that were taught in those seven churches that contradicted what christ has done in his finished work that's why in chapter one he begins the book by establishing that it is christ who died who has saved us who has washed us with his blood and has made us kings and priests unto our God. Then he began to say to him that overcome it. And then he began to deal with the fact that the overcomer will have rewards with Jesus. Then he now wrote to the angel of the churches who are doctrinal instructors and began to rebuke them for false teachings that contradicted what Christ has done in his burial and resurrection. That's what the book of Revelation generally is about. So even that context we're looking at now is a rebuke on doctrinal teachings doctrinal teachings that contradicted the finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. On, on a final note, should a government build a cathedral for the nation for the worship of God? Well, it depends. Um, it could be wrong, it could be right, depending you know, um, what the government aims to achieve. You know, the government uh, aims to achieve a, a place of worship. Yeah, I mean, if there's no place that can take believers you know, when believers are having big occasions, big conferences, and the government decides to provide a facility that, you know, national meetings can hold, believers' conferences, global meetings can hold in those venues, and they make revenue out of it for government, there's nothing wrong with it. And the government says that the inauguration of the presidents going forward will be done there? Nothing wrong with it, just like America. If people are opposed to it and say that we don't have water, we don't have food, well, then you are going to build a cathedral. Again, like I said, it depends on the government. So the government will know its priorities. They must know, what am I here for? I'm here to take care of my people. So is cathedral superior to the needs of the people? We need roads. We need health care facilities. We need educational facilities. If that is not yet provided, National Cathedral is not what you need. We, will ne we might never finish providing that because America hasn't finished. No, what, and they what, say, seek ye first the kingdom what, and everything what shall I mean be added. by provide is at least there should be basic. It should basically be provided. We may not have it in its robust form, but there should be a skeletal provision all over. Oh, that one every African country has. Oh, so, but uh, they say that seek ye first the kingdom. No, the kingdom is not physical building. God does not dwell in physical temples. So if they are building it for God, it's not God doesn't live there. God will never live there. God has never lived there. God lives in people. And that is why it is much more a, a service of God to take care of the people in whom he lives than to just build a monument that nobody uses all the time. No, they would use it. They would have the National Cathedral. They can call for National Prayer. They can call for but something. But it's not weekly. No, it's not weekly. Exactly. But it has other purposes. The cathedral that was designed by the government, they say it has other purposes. It has tourism potentials he has everything and there's a whole place dedicated so like, like and like, prime like, land was taken for this like i said it depends on the priority of that government because each government has campaign promises it has its policies and priorities it depends on what that government has should said. christians support a national cathedral well whether they support or not it will be done if government decides to do it whilst the government is doing it should christians support it 
Well, go- Christians are supposed to pray for government and wish government well. Christians are supposed to pray for government. And wish them well. And wish the government well. That's what the so if you're a Christian and a government is doing something, you have to support it. Well, because you are supposed to pray for government. Well, you just pray for them. You don't if I don't to. support the party that has won the election in government, why should I pray for you them? You necessarily don't have to support them, but you pray for them. I, I don't support them. I'm an, I'm, I support the other party that didn't win the election. The ones they have won, they are the, they are the government of your day. They determine the policies and everything. So you pray for them so that you know god will but help i them. want them to lose the election so my people will win why should i pray well for why them? should the whole society suffer for all the years that it takes in the constitution before there is another election oh so you pray for them to succeed but if they succeed they'll win the next election well if they succeed and they win and they're doing well for the people let them do at least there's a t- there's a period to which where their tenure will end completely and a new government will have to come but if they power. do well when their tenure ends they'll win again well again the bible just says pray for those in authority but I, i'm not a, part of them i don't it want doesn't them to matter you don't have to be a part of them to wish them well i don't want them to they win. are the government of the day at least they should be so i'm peter this. obi supporter i should pray for bolatini oh, you why? should no no i want him to fail in four years then we can win well you shouldn't that's not the will of god the will of god is for you to pray for the government yeah but, but, the will but of i god, support peter obi he prays he's a good christian bolatini is not a good christian once the man he won the election. once the man has been sworn into power he becomes your commander in chief the best you do is to pray for him even if you're not going to your church him. pray for bolatini we're praying for him every day if he comes to your church to speak to the church, would you permit it? As the father of the land, yes, I'll give him a microphone to greet the church. Election time is running for a second time. He comes, shows I'm him. not going to give him a microphone. But he's still the father of the land, even if no, he's no, running no, for no, election. No, 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 because at that time, we know that there's a transition in already beginning. And I know the calendar. I know how it functions. So I know what is coming. So now you allow him? I'll allow him because, I mean... He's the father of the land. Yes. If the senator in your area wants to come and speak to the church, it's okay. What is he going to speak? I've got to know what he wants to say. But he's the father of the of the as a senator. He's the father of the of the. Still, area. I've got to know what he wants to say. But with the president, you don't want to know what he's going to say. You well, put him because again, he's father the, of the, the land. president will not just travel all the way to come and speak to my church. He will tell me there's a reason why I want to speak to them. He will share with me. Mm. Yeah. Super Eagles have qualified for the World Cup just before they go to the World Cup. They want to come to your church for what? Prayer. Well, I wish them well. No, they want to be in the church for prayer. If you they, put them on the stage, line them up, and then. And then you say the super eagles are here let's stand up and pray for them this world cup nigeria has to go far to the glory of god no i'm just going to wish them well i'm going to tell them yeah you can come to our church and worship we don't keep you out so you hear the word of god and at the end we'll say hey guys you have trained train some more as you go and just trust god do your best nothing nothing more Mm -mm. you won't pray that they should win the my prayer is not going to make them win or lose it is the, the their practice their skills they are exercising. Oh, but there's a lot of luck in football. A, a ball that hits the post today could have gone into the nets tomorrow. Well, so there's a bit of providence uh, in football. And well, so prayer can work. That prayer will have worked where they were doing exercise, where they were doing their training, where they were developing themselves to go and engage in that competition. Thank you very much, Dr. Damina. Thank this you so much. Interview. Thank so, you for having me. We are so grateful for having you here on our platform. Kindly hit the subscribe button if you are new here and also like this message for us do well to comment in the comment section because we want to know what you learned and where you're watching us from thank you message community